Good morning, BSBI. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to share the wonderful uh, wildlife and flora and fauna of Castletown, the main. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the next half an hour or so uh, and get some good information. So I'm going to just kick off. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of history uh, to the house itself. As you can see, it's a, a very large Palladian style mansion. Um, it was built between 1722 and 1729 for Thomas Connolly, who was uh, the richest man in Ireland at the time. Um, I'm going to fast forward them from 1729 to 1967, uh, when the house was in a really, really bad uh, state of repair. Um, Desmond Guinness stepped in and actually bought the house and 120 acres of, of, uh, of parkland and basically saved the, the house and the estate uh, for, for their heritage. Uh, and it's to his eternal credit for that. Um, between, sorry, in 1994, the Office of Public Works then took over the estate um, and did a complete restoration of the house from basement to roof. Uh, it is now a completely restored uh, museum level uh, uh, Palladian house, absolutely beautiful, and it's open to the public, really well worth a visit to. So then in 2007, um, there was a landscape restoration project uh, started. So between 2007 and 2012, um, the original pathways, there was over three kilometers of original pathways uh, unearthed and overlaid. Uh, two uh, stone bridges were completely restored, a nice house and a temple renovated uh, over a kilometer of ha uh, which are dry stone wall ditches. Uh, were repaired and our uh, 18th century pond, uh, which was completely silted over, was desilted, uh, reprofiled and refilled and is now a magnificent um, feature in the landscape. So where are we today? Uh, in Castleown House we have 240 acres now. Uh, that's uh, made up of mixed woodlands, semi-natural grassland, riparian linear scrub, tree-lined avenues, ponds and ha, -ha ditches. And to put the estate into context as such, if you look at this uh, plan drawing, uh, we're actually an island. We are uh, surrounded uh, on the west side here by Selbridge and uh, housing estates. To the north, housing estates and motorway. To the east, it's uh, industrial complexes. And to the south, we have the, uh, the river Liffey yourself. So basically, uh, this really makes it such an important uh, site. Uh, it's critically important, really, as a refuge uh, for the plant and animal communities that, that uh, depend on it for their survival. So today, uh, what I would like to do is cover four areas. Uh, grassland management, wildlife management, trees old and new, pests, diseases, and invasive species. So we're going to kick off with uh, uh, grassland information. Uh, and basically here we go. See in this picture here, we have two uh, obvious uh, different management techniques. Um, down here in the bottom, we have rough grassland. This area is about 20 acres or so, uh, and it is just left and cut only uh, once every five years, and the biomass is left on site. Whereas up here in the top left, we have an area here, it's about 60 acres in total, uh, and that's uh, uh, managed as a long summer meadow. So it's cut uh, once a year and the material is, is taken away. Uh, this gives it a fantastic uh, succession of flowering plants from April all the way through to September when it's cut, which uh, provides a balanced, uh, constant balanced food supply for uh, birds and for uh, uh, pollinators. So the long summer meadow, first of all, um, here we have our long summer meadow. This is in around July time, uh, and it's full of, of, of you know, a large variety of, of, of flowering plants. Uh, the succession works in such a way from April to June. We start off really with just dandelions, uh, followed by cowslips and cuckoo flower. And the cuckoo flower itself is, is a, a really important plant. It's the uh, larval food plant of orange tip butterflies. So we try to encourage them. Uh, bulbous buttercups then come along and yellow rattle. Now yellow rattle is probably one of the most important uh, wild plants um, for these floral meadows. Um, it's hemiparasitic, so it actually uh, parasitizes the uh, heavier grasses and the tussocky grasses like uh, Coxfoot and Yorkshire Fog, um, therefore reducing them 
uh, and allowing more space and a, a thinner sward for uh, the wildflowers and uh, finer grasses to, to seed out and thrive. Uh, going on from uh, June up to September, um, we, uh, we have goat's beard, three species of orchid, birch foot trefoil, which is again the a food plant for common blue butterfly, uh, wild carrots and yarrows, bed straws, knapweeds, uh, and hawk's beards. So there's a, just a fantastic array of, of plants uh, throughout the summer. We also have had, uh, obviously in here, we, we have grasses growing through as well. And BSBI uh, were kind enough to do a workshop recently and identify 12 grass, grasses uh, in, in our meadows. Uh, and we're glad to have those confirmed. The other uh, method of, of management is uh, our rough grassland. Uh, this, as I said before, is uh, only cut once every five years uh, and the material is actually left on site. So we're actually increasing the fertility of the soil. Um, it's really important, these types of, 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 of habitats, um, particularly as we have barn owl, um, and that's one of the main reasons why we decided to, to manage the 20 acres this way. Um, it's fantastic habitat for mice and shrews, which obviously are the prey species of, of, of this rare bird. Um, it's also uh, the coxfoot here, as you can see, is a food plant for speckled wood butterflies. Um, and it's also fantastic, the, the, the habitat itself for bumblebees. Um, we have three species of bumblebee that, that nest in the in the, the this rough grassland. Uh, white-tailed bumblebee, red-tailed bumblebee, and carder bee. And they, you know, there's mice holes in the in the ground here, which the, the, the first two use, and the carder bees tend to just uh, nest in the cover of the tussocky grasses. Uh, also, the, the this type of, of rough grassland, it wants to get to woodland. It, it wants to, to get to climax vegetation. So we have, at, as we're on in year five at the moment, we have a lot of meadow sweet coming in, uh, briars, uh, some oak and some alder uh, self-seeded in. Um, so it's time to, to cut that and get us back to the to the, 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 the grassland habitat that we need. Um, one of the, I suppose, uh, or, or awkward plants that we have in the inner meadows is the uh, ragwort. Um, we have to pull this every year um, or it just gets completely out of control. Um, it takes about two weeks and it's an awful bloody job. Uh, but it has to be done in order to, to uh, give room for, for the finer uh, species that we want to keep. That said, it, it, it produces a lot of pollen and nectar, uh, bumblebees and, and uh, butterflies love it. Uh, but again, it's, you know, we, we need to control it. Uh, so we remove almost 95% of it, leave a small quantity uh, for cinnabar moths. This is a small copper butterfly, and they, they tend to use the ragwort as vantage points to chase rivals away, uh, and obviously to get some food as well. The, the larval food plant of, of this particular species is a common sorrel, uh, Rumex acetosa, uh, which we have in, in abundance. Another uh, tool that we use uh, in managing our meadows is actually cutting the edges. You can see here, uh, we've about a metre, metre and a half or so on, along all the edges of the meadow. And it just puts it into context. It, it makes it very obvious to people when they come in uh, to, to decide for the first time that it is a, a management uh, tool. We also do uh, pathways through the meadow. This runs this straight up here and it turns and goes across over here. And it actually joins up two or three architectural features that we want to show off. But again, it just gets people into the middle of the meadow. It's absolutely beautiful in, in, in high summer uh, with the grasshoppers and uh, bumblebees and hoverflies and dragonflies buzzing with all the flowers. It's just a wonderful place to be. Uh, we would recommend visiting July is probably about the best month of the year. Uh, again, another uh, thing that we do is we put signage up. <clears throat> As you can see here, uh, this is from the National Biodiversity Data Center. Uh, we our meadows have been awarded three times. Once we've won the overall uh, All-Ireland Pollinator Award uh, and twice we've won it for our, our particular category uh, with a large domain uh, uh, for managing our wildlife in, in a sensitive manner. Which brings us on to wildlife management. So it's what have we got and what do we do for them? 
Well, you need to know what you have in order to be able to manage what, what you have in, in the best possible way. And what we have here in Castletown presently is uh, 60 plus species of birds, uh, 10 species of bumblebee and one of uh, uh, honeybee, 15 species of butterfly, 10 of mammals, seven species of bat, eight species of solitary bee, three species of solitary wasp, European eel, uh, white clawed crayfish and common frog. So how do we manage them? But what do they need is the question. And what uh, birds need is a food, shelter and opportunities for next nesting. And you can see here, uh, nest box here for dipper. Um, from the off, when we, when we started to do the clearance works on the estate in 2007, uh, and you can imagine there was about 80 years of, of neglect. So there was a lot of, an awful lot of self-seeded trees and, and, and scrub uh, to be cleared. And just in mitigation, we, we started to put up uh, bird and bat boxes uh, along the areas that we cleared. Um, currently, we have a comprehensive uh, organized uh, partnership with Kildare Birdwatch. Uh, and we have boxes up for barn owl, for kestrel, for dipper, for robins, spotted fly catchers, uh, wagtails and swifts. And here we see uh, another box. This is a, a barn owl box on top of a, a, a beach monolith. Um, when we started the works on the estate in 2007, there were several very, very large beech trees uh, in, in really bad condition uh, and they needed to be removed. But where we could keep them, we kept them as monoliths. Uh, basically to show people you know, that there was wonderful large trees in, the, in these areas. Um, and with the, the, leaving the monoliths gave another opportunity, which is this, we put up barn owl boxes on several of these. Um, and in the base of this tree as well, uh, there is a, a hollow. Uh, it had a, a lot of Ganoderma uh, fungal uh, growths on it. Um, and we have a colony of a uh, wild uh, Irish black uh, honeybee. And they've been living and surviving in this the butt of this tree for the last six years, uh, surviving on their own, uh, just you know using the, our uh, flowering trees uh, and the flowers in in, in the uh, long summer meadow uh, for their survival. Another thing that we do for um, besides providing the, the nesting box opportunities for for birds, um, is that we actually manage other plants. So on the example, on our pond, we would manage sparganium or sparganium and typha uh, to leave clumps, which are lovely nesting platforms for little grebes and coots. Um, in our woodlands, we, uh, we do some coppicing, uh, which again produces a lot of multi-stem growth, which is very good for uh, wrens to, to nest in. We also de-leader some trees in order to, to produce uh, forking. Uh, again, this produces a platform for uh, birds like blackbirds and thrushes to 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 build their nests. So there's there's ways of managing uh, the, these these plants in order to to optimize uh, breeding habitat. Food, of course, is is another major thing, um, and we plant a lot of of plants, native plants, with berries and seeds uh, for for our birds. So uh, berry wise, we uh, Crataegus monogyna, Prunus vinosa. Uh, Sorbus occuparia, Prunus padus, Prunus avium, and Ilex acrofolium would be the, the main species that we that uh, provide berry foods. Seed wise, uh, we've planted Alnus uh, incana, Cordata, and Glutinosa, uh, and Betula pubescens and Pendula, uh, which provide a, a, a really good seed source for red poles and siskins uh, and other small birds in the wintertime. Now, uh, that's the uh, birds. I wanted to, to do something on pollinators uh, and how we manage things for, for them, how we manage the, the environment for them. And first off, uh, springtime. Spring is the, is the most important time for, for bumblebees. Um, we have the queen bumblebees coming out of hibernation then. They would have hibernated in the tussocky grass and you know, in the 20 acres that we manage in as rough grassland. Uh, and they come out of hibernation in, in, in early spring uh, and they depend on the dandelions for their, their survival. Um, a queen bumblebee needs to manage and, uh, or visit over 6,000 plants 
per day in order to be able to produce enough energy to brood her young. So it's, it's a, an absolute massive task for them. So the more we can supply, the more food we can supply for them in this early time of the year, uh, the better. You can never have enough dandelions. Uh, uh, and here we can see how the succession works in the top. We have uh, the papi of the dandelions they've gone over, which is now a seed source for siskins and for red poles and goldfinch. Uh, and following on from the dandelions, we have the primulaveris providing the, the next source of, of, of nectar in the meadow. Here we have another plant that's uh, increasing. It, it tends to like the damper sections of, of our meadow, uh, but we're trying to encourage it it's, uh, to expand its range more. Uh, Cardamine pretensis, cuckoo flower. It's the larval food plant of the orange tip butterfly. Uh, so it's really important that we, we try and, and increase its numbers. In our woodland and on the verges of the woodland, as you can see we have a swathe of colour uh, here uh, with an enemy nemorosa, uh, lesser celandine, and just you see little flecks of blue here and there is Viola riviniana. Again, really important for um, food source for uh, butterflies and hoverflies and bees when they come out of, of hibernation. So that's food. Uh, we need to also provide shelter. Uh, and we do this in many ways, besides the hedgerows that we manage and, and, and the tussocky grasslands, we also have a program of, uh, of for breeding these red mason bees. Um, the, these are a fantastic little solitary bee. Uh, as you can see them here, they're really hairy, uh, which makes them really fantastic pollinators. Uh, this is a male and here's a, a female. And the boxes that we use here, um, they have a view panel in them so you can actually see all of the activity. And I could go on, I, I don't have time to go into the, the, the full way of management, but needless to say, at the end of, of uh, summer, we end up with all of these uh, pollen balls here with eggs in them, which turn into, into larvae and cocoons, and then we harvest the cocoons. Um, and the beauty about this system is that we can, uh, when we harvest the cocoons, we can ensure that all of these will survive till spring. Uh, and then we can clean and sterilize the boxes and put them out again, which is, is most important. I just wanted to uh, show you another uh, little solitary bee, uh, which is a, a particular plant association. Uh, this is a yellow faced solitary bee, and the particular plant that she uh, loves is Herb Robert, uh, Roberta, Geranium Robertianum. And what she does is really bizarre. Uh, she goes, visits the flower, and collects nectar and pollen from, from the geranium robertianum, uh, blows bubbles through it, and the sun evaporates the, uh, some of the liquid, uh, so it makes it into a sort of a thick, gloopy material. And then she brings it back to our, our little uh, nest channels and regurgitates it, lays an egg in it, and you can see here the larvae hatched, and, uh, and basically it, it eats the gloop and transforms into a, a, an adult uh, yellow-faced bee, in a cocoon and hatches the following uh, summer. Uh, just again, I wanted to show you some species uh, of flowers that are uh, uh, in our meadows and, and surrounding grasslands. Uh, here we have uh, two of the three species of orchids in our meadow, uh, pyramidal orchid and uh, common spotted orchid. Um, here along by the pond, we have prolif proliferation of plants. Uh, we have water mint here, uh, water forget-me-not, purple loose strife, uh, philopendula, and a flea bane here. And again, it's just wonderful opportunities for uh, pollinators uh, to, to feed. Here we have woundwort and water mint, again, two really attractive plants to, to bumblebees. And again, here's the turret orchid species that we have, uh, the bee orchid. Now, the bee orchids have only really come into uh, Castletown in the last couple of years, um, and they're doing really, really well. Beautiful to see them uh, in between the uh, pyramidal orchids in our, in our meadow. And this here we have is Linaria purpurea. It's a garden escape bee, it, it, uh, what you call it, a, grows in walls and uh, all over the place. 
and it's particularly attractive to hoverflies. Uh, this hoverfly here is a, a pied hover, hoverfly, and it's actually migrates to Ireland from Europe every year, would you believe? Uh, but a great plant association. Now I wanted to show you uh, some species that you wouldn't be aware of, I suppose. Uh, these are two butterfly species uh, that are new to Castletown. Uh, this one, this one is the silver wash fritillary. Uh, it's only literally just come in this year. We've had uh, our first uh, confirmed uh, sightings, uh, and here we have a common butterfly. And the commas uh, again confirmed sightings last year and this year. Uh, this this butterfly is expanding its range, and obviously we're providing uh, the, the the perfect habitat for them. Uh, so we're getting new species in, which is is uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, other things that we have on site that you probably wouldn't be aware of is the, the likes of these uh, little devils, uh, ruby tails, uh, parasitic wasp, and this is a parasite on our uh, red mason bees. Uh, a beautiful uh, little thing, only about three millimeters long. This gorgeous uh, is, uh, insect is a willow mason potter wasp. She's uh, beautiful, but she's a predatory wasp. And she's a real friend of, a gar of gardeners. She goes and collects um, sawfly larvae uh, and carries them in her jaws and flies back to the nest uh, box, packs in about eight or nine uh, sawfly larvae, which are paralyzed, they're not dead, and then lays her, her egg in, in, into them and seals them in clay. Uh, beautiful but deadly. And here we have a this is not a wasp, yellow and black though, though she is. This is actually a solitary bee, uh, Nomada marshamala. Uh, and it's actually a cuckoo solitary bee. So she does exactly as, as the cuckoo does in the bird world. She lays her eggs in the nest of another species and allows them to, uh, to, to, to rear. A few couple of plants that I wanted to show uh, that don't have a particular uh, insect association, um, but I just wanted to show you them as, as they are quite unusual. Uh, Harry St. John's wort is uh, red listed. Um, we have a management program in place, uh, which has seen it increase its numbers uh, fivefold in the last 10 years. So we're really, really pleased with the way that that uh, program is working out. Another plant uh, that comes out in spring, I love, I love to see this coming up. It's, it's just so alien. Uh, toothwort, uh, beautiful parasitic, obviously no chlorophyll, uh, tends to jump up all around our pond area, around the roots of trees. Coming on to mammals, uh, and I'm going to just going to fly through these really. Uh, the whole estate and the way it's, it's, it's with all the different habitats is the reason we have all of these different mammals. So we have otter, stoat, brown rat, pygmy shoe, field mouse, gray squirrel, unfortunately, hedgehog, fox, rabbit, and mink again, unfortunately. A following on from that, we have, the, these are the species of bats that we have, uh, Darbentons, uh, and uh, particularly around the river and the pond, lizards and natters, woodlands, the pips and the tree species of pipistrelle and brown long-eared bats. And we actually have a, besides a bat box program going on, we also have a set up a bat sanctuary in the uh, basement of one of our farm buildings. So onto trees, I, I just wanted to, to actually touch on, on uh, the different trees species that we have. Uh, but first of all, the tree safety management uh, plan. Th this document was drawn up uh, because we we have quite a lot of tree cover, um, so how we manage our trees, all of the areas on the estate are zoned, and all the trees within those zones are then prioritised into you know one, two, or three, and then all prioritised trees are then uh, condition surveyed uh, to see how they are physiologically, uh, disease wise, um, and then uh, works are done according to uh, the information that's gleaned from from the surveys. So the idea is to keep the trees uh, for as long as possible, uh, but to keep them safe for, uh, with people. Uh, so the oldest tree that we have on site is a yew tree. It's four and a half meters in diameter and almost 25 meters tall. It's probably around 450 years old or so. Uh, we have a beautiful veteran oak on the uh, avenue. A, this tree is, re as you can see, it's retrenched. It's really uh, shrinking down. Um, 
it would have been here prior to the avenue being planted and we presume it was left there and not dug out because of its its already great age at the time the tallest trees we have uh, sequoia dendron giganteum and abies alba a the quirkiest trees we have a beautiful black locust uh, rubinia pseudocassia uh, down by the river and this is so full of, of uh, crevices and grooves and, and niches uh, that this is really a fantastic almost Airbnb for bats in, in, in the summertime uh, for, for to roost in. Uh, another really old tree we have here is a, a real old horse chestnut, uh, 300 year olds plus. Uh, and we put up this signage particularly uh, and it works really well. I think if you tell people don't do this or don't do that, they, they tend to be ignored. But if you ask people nicely, uh, it's, it's really worked in this tree and, and we've no damage done to it for, for a long time now. Um, the Georgians were fantastic people for introducing new plants. And we've continued on the tradition ourselves. Uh, so some of the trees we've introduced, uh, this is a se uh, Sequoia Semper Virens. Uh, we have Eastern Hemlock, uh, Suga canadensis, uh, down in the, uh, the uh, lower Liffey Walk area, uh, we planted this uh, Serbian spruce, uh, Poesia omorica, uh, Himalayan pine, the uh, Pinus willisiana. Uh, another thing that we do in our, with our uh, trees, uh, managing management wise for wildlife, is as you can see here, the Lime Avenue, uh, and we leave the vegetation in between the trees um, from April to September. And it just uh, creates this fantastic wildlife corridor uh, all the way along the, the, the Selvage Avenue. I just want to cover a few things on, on very quickly on pests and diseases and invasive species. Uh, we all know this one. We have a big problem with it on, along the uh, River Liffey. Uh, the Himalayan balsam uh, causes a lot of problems with um, just, just shading out all of the native plants and then it dies off and we, we get a lot of erosion uh, in, in winter storms when, when the river is in flood. Uh, so it is a problem. Uh, unfortunately, there is no joined up thinking uh, but, you know, between agencies and it really is, is a thing that needs to be looked at uh, across uh, interagencies. The ragwort again, not strictly an invasive species but it does cause major problems in our in our meadow uh, so i consider it invasive in, in in our meadow so if anybody has a few hundred thousand of these cinnabar moth caterpillars i would love to uh, buy them off them for for next summer so i'd be pulling them another uh, new uh, problem or pest is uh, the horse chestnut leaf miner and as if horse chestnuts didn't have enough problems with uh, bleeding uh, canker and uh, leaf blotch disease uh, and along comes this uh, little uh, leaf miner it actually lives between the, the upper and lower epidermis of uh, of the leaf uh, and i've actually i cut one out just to show you this is one pupated already um but like it, it's like it's really only a, a an aesthetic thing um it doesn't look great having all of these the damage to, to the leaf. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's not going to kill the tree. Uh, and last week, I actually saw a whole family of blue tits hanging upside down on the leaves, picking out these because uh, they're literally just under the surface. Um, so they're providing a lot of protein for, uh, for bird species. Uh, ash dieback, again, is endemic across the country. Um, we uh, unfortunately have 15 acres of, uh, of, a, of a woodland that's 95% ash. Um, so we're actually drawing up a, a management plan as we speak uh, as to how we're going to uh, manage this disease and uh, get, get replant going. Again, I just wanted to show uh, a couple of unusual things. Uh, we haven't touched on fungi at all. Uh, and these are uh, appropriately named earth stars they're the most alien little fruiting bodies i've ever come across uh, very small they're only about uh, six to ten mil uh, high uh, but uh, beautiful little structures uh, and finally uh, this is a plant called white spindles clavaria vermicularis and the thing with white spindles is it's it's a it's edible apparently um I came across it because when we were pulling ragwort, you, you cover you know, every square inch of the place, and I just noticed this. Um, but in, uh, it's an indicator species, 
uh, and it actually shows that there uh, has been no insecticides, fungicides, or uh, any pesticides used in, in these grasslands. And it, it says it all about how we manage the meadows uh, and the other habitats in Castletown itself. And that's really uh, it. Uh, I hope that was of value to you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me at, at my email address here, and I'd like to hand you back to uh, Paul.